I'm reminded of um, when Dr. Borlaug was, um, I guess his last days with us, um, he just implored everyone who would go up and visit him in Dallas to uh, not let up on this fight um, to address global hunger. And uh, this is the reason we're here uh, for these couple of days. It's important that, that we don't forget that, that we don't lose sight of, of why we're here. Um, I was um, surprised to hear, of course, of all the, the different statistics that are quoted, uh, because as, as Julie mentioned, we have such a technologically advanced uh, society in so many ways, uh, certainly here in the, in the United States, and um, you know we have a very efficient uh, system of agricultural production, and yet, uh, if you look at those statistics, look how many people in this planet uh, still go undernourished. And if you look at that uh, map, uh, as Julie mentioned, you, you see uh, that there's so many countries um, in Africa, in Asia, certainly in Latin America, that still have so many people who uh, go to bed hungry. Um, and, and those who actually don't go to bed hungry um, may have enough to eat, but maybe they don't have the right quality of food to eat. And that's another very important issue that we're going to, to discuss here these couple of days. In fact, um, I'm going to take this off so I can see what I'm doing. There we go. I do a lot better this way. Um, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, uh, she has taken it upon herself to, to launch a bit of a campaign uh, it's called the, the first thousand days. And basically what, what she is, is talking about is what a lot of experts know, which is the first thousand days in the life of a human being are very important. They're critical. Uh, it's a window of opportunity. It says from pregnancy through age two. So it's really even in utero from uh, the time of conception to age two in which nutrition interventions can dramatically improve uh, the chances of survival and of living a healthy and proper, prosperous life uh, for people. So it's become that critical where we, we realize that if we don't make interventions at the right time, uh, we're going to have a, a world here, continue to have a world with so many people, their potential just not being realized. And that, of course, has so many different consequences. You see up here a couple of banners uh, with quotes from Dr. Borlaug himself. Cultivate the fields to produce more bread. Otherwise, there will be no peace. And then my favorite, world peace will not and cannot be built on empty stomachs. Do you believe that? Absolutely. All we have to do is look around the world, uh, places where there's strife, where there's social unrest. It begins by people not being able to feed themselves and their family. Um, and so it's important that we, that we do this work because it's what's going to help some, alleviate so many other issues. The Feed the Future initiative. This is really what today uh, is all about here uh, for this summit. Um, we are here to learn about this initiative and to, to see what we can do as experts in our individual fields um, to, to alleviate this problem. This is an initiative that is, is really the, the U.S. government's initiative on how to address global hunger. Um, there was a, a meeting of the G8 in Rome back in 2009, actually it was at L'Aquila, um, and in that meeting, all the various countries that are members of the G8, including the United States, came together and decided that something had to be done about global hunger because it's in the best interest of everybody to alleviate this problem. And so they arrived at five principles um, so that we can be successful at addressing global hunger uh, on a worldwide scale. Investing in country-owned plans, this would mean that uh, the countries that would be focused on to try to help them with, uh, with hunger issues uh, would develop their own plans, uh, with some help perhaps, but certainly develop their own plans so that they have buy-in into this issue. Um, strengthening strategic coordination so that uh, we would get the maximum bang for our buck, if you will, to have as many uh, players as there can be, but then to coordinate the efforts as well as possible. Ensure that the approach is comprehensive, not just attack one little aspect, but do it 
all the way, a systems-based approach, all the way from uh, not only research, definitely extension, and, and also education and capacity building, and to do it truly from farm to fork. Leverage the benefits of a variety of institutions. Uh, there's a lot to be gained by uh, involving land-grant universities. Obviously, we are one of them, and we know what our assets and resources are. But there's foundations, there's private industry, there's lots of other players uh, that can, can play a role here, as well as, as governments, certainly. And then lastly, deliver sustained and accountable results for the resources that are spent. Very important. People work hard for the money, and so whether it's taxpayer money or foundation money or private industry money, whatever the source of the money must be, spent wisely and um, the results need to be sustainable, but uh, those who use those resources must be accountable for those expenditures. So very important principles that they developed. And so uh, a guide called the Feed the Future Guide was published, Feed the Future being the U.S. government's portion of this contribution towards addressing global hunger. When we go into our breakout sessions this afternoon, uh, we have some copies of the Feed the Future Guide to hand out to all of you. Uh, but if not, you can, if you don't get a copy, you can certainly go to their website and, and find and download a copy. So the specifics of, of this global hunger uh, initiative, if you will, is the G8 countries collectively pledged $22 billion. The U.S. portion of it uh, that President Obama committed to was $3.5 billion over three years. Now, just because the President of the United States pledges a certain amount of money doesn't mean it's going to all happen because uh, it's Congress that, right? The President proposes and Congress disposes is what we, we learned in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, but it's important. It's an important statement that he made that three and a half billion dollars uh, for three years would be would be pledged towards the U.S. contribution to this effort. And so um, the U.S. government decided, well, let's focus on these 20 countries. And if you see them listed here, um, they're really in in three continents: in Asia, in Africa, and in Latin America, as the countries that would need not only need the most help, but countries where you can probably make the biggest difference quicker than in other places. So the Feed the Future initiative, when you get a copy of that booklet, booklet uh, you will see that it consists of three broad areas. Um, and I know that some of you in the back maybe can't read all of this, so I'm going to go over it a little bit here for you. Um, number one is to advance the productivity frontier. In other words, increase production of, of food crops, animal, uh, products, you've got to have more uh, for there to be enough for people to, to be uh, fed. And the focus would be on breeding and genetics of staple crops and livestock. And in doing so, you've got to be able to address various obstacles, uh, pests, diseases, drought, other risks, uh, and focusing it on small producers, which is really how most of these countries operate is with small producers. And the idea is to enhance the yield potential of, of these staple crops and livestock. The second thing would be to transform those production systems um, to, to very much use uh, technology to uh, enhance your, your efficiency at, at producing more. You've got to do it not with, you know, 19th century or 20th century technology. It's got to be 21st century technology so it can be as, as effective as possible. So in priority geographic areas where the poor are concentrated, and these 20 countries uh, would fit that uh, definition, the idea would be to use technological advances uh, with applied research so that we can um, produce more crops, uh, more livestock, while conserving the soil, our water resources, extending uh, the knowledge, and increasing market opportunities in a system-based approach that they're calling sustainable intensification, where you're really using the most, you're using your natural resources as much as possible, but in a sustainable way, okay? Uh, it's maximizing that yield by using technology to extract as much juice from that orange, if you will. 
And then lastly, enhance nutrition and food safety. A very important key to the Feed the Future initiative. Focusing on increasing productivity, specifically of grain legumes, uh, reducing mycotoxin contamination, uh, because that's you know, not something that we are super concerned with in this country, but certainly in the developing world, mycotoxins are a huge problem uh, for, for human health. Fortifying staple crops, increasing availability of the source of uh, animal foods. And Dr. Cross, you're here, you'll be happy to hear that, that you know, animal production is a huge part of this. Protein, it's a very good source of protein and it's so important to have that. There's been studies done um, by some of our scientists through the Borlaug Institute in collaboration with other universities like UC Davis to, that show, not surprisingly, that the cognitive ability of children increases dramatically when, you, when they're able to, feed, to eat at least one serving of meat a day. So very important to do that. Um, and improving the dietary diversity, uh, particularly in women and children. And one of the things about Feed the Future is that there's, there's several themes within, within these three categories of increasing production, using technology, and enhancing nutrition and food safety. I would say there's, there's a few themes that kind of uh, play throughout all of this, which is focusing on women and children um, and, and focusing on, on sustainability of our natural resources. So very important to, to keep those in mind. And of course, we have uh, Malcolm Butler here from APLU, and I will introduce him to you in a, in a little while. And he is, is going to expand more on, on these themes uh, this morning. Okay. Who are the important players in this Feed the Future initiative of the federal government? This is a, an incredible opportunity because it's what the federal government has decided, okay, we're going to do something in a focused manner. We're going to call it Feed the Future, and we're going to basically marshal our, our resources and, and our talent in our country to address this issue. So within the U.S. government, there's various departments of the government that are involved in Feed the Future. The most prominent is USAID. Uh, let me ask a question. How many people have now or have ever had uh, a, a USAID-funded project? Okay, so we've got lots of people in this room, but not everybody. Um, and so you know uh, what USAID does. Certainly it is the agency that is, is focused on, um, on aid to other countries, and certainly uh, feeding those countries is very important. But USDA, uh, obviously involved as well. Treasury Department, very surprising to me, uh, as well as others, very much interested in this issue. On, on the right side of the slide, you see a picture of the current administrator of USAID, Dr. Shaw, who used to, uh, he's an MD, he used to work at the uh, Gates Foundation, and he also was at USDA. Uh, if you remember, he used to be the Undersecretary for Research, Education, and Economics for a little bit until he moved over to USAID. Um, but then, besides the U.S. government, we have other players, very important players. Um, APLU, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. Uh, somebody was telling me yesterday that they went to, uh, to talk to a faculty member who said, well, what is APLU? And, and I think uh, the answer was, well, you're, you are an, an, at an LU right now, so you better find out what an APLU is. Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. And as I said, uh, Mr. Butler is going to speak to us uh, about the work that they've been doing in relationship to Feed the Future. Importantly, what I wanted to point out to you is the picture on the right uh, is Dr. Peter McPherson, who is the president uh, of APLU which APLU, of course, uh, deals with a lot of different issues that are important to land-grant universities. Um, but he has a personal passion for international work. He used to be uh, administrator of USAID years ago. So he has a special interest in this topic. And he has a special relationship, I would say, Malcolm, uh, with uh, Dr. Shaw. Um, so that's, that's becoming uh, very important in terms of uh, the influence that Langren universities can have on the thinking, the policy development at USAID, which is a long-term and coming. BIFAD is the Board for International Food and Agricultural Development, is a board that is um, designated by Congress 
was designated by Congress to advise the USAID Administrator on matters of food and agriculture policy. The members of BIFID are appointed by the President of the United States. Um, I have the privilege of serving on BIFID. I'm on my last year. I was appointed by President Bush, so, so I'm one of the people who are uh, coming off of their term of office. And it's, it's afforded me a tremendous opportunity to, to get a glimpse at what's going on in the international arena in policy and certainly uh, what, what has been going on with USAID. Of course, there's other entities, the centers, uh, CGIARs that we're going to hear more about uh, tomorrow, uh, which play a tremendous role. These centers are located throughout the world, and they are supported by the governments of several countries. The biggest donor contributor is the U.S. government, uh, and these centers conduct research, conduct other activities, and, and we should be able to partner with them as much as we can. And then the NGO community, the non-government organizations, uh, both the nonprofits and those that are for-profit firms that are so good at getting contracts out of USAID uh, and then turning around and uh, subcontracting it to us. Um, well, we can certainly take advantage of that kind of an arrangement, but we can also um, do things a little bit differently. And certainly uh, other countries, foundations, private industry, all can play a role in this arena. Okay. Um, Wanted to give you some flavor for the what's been happening uh, since President Obama made that pledge of three and a half billion dollars over three years uh, in 2009. Well, in the spring of 2010 is when the U.S. government came out with their implementation guide uh, that I'm going to supply you a copy of uh, during the breakout session. Then, at the end of the year of 2010. Um, Something important happened, at least in my mind, important. Uh, the State Department, Secretary Clinton, conducted, she was brand new uh, at that job pretty much, and conducted a, a big review of the State Department, including USAID. And uh, what they came up with is the fact that uh, Feed the Future, as an initiative of the federal government, uh, would be front and center within the State Department in terms of being the initiative to address global hunger. Um, that's important because uh, those of you who have worked in, in Washington, D.C. know that when the U.S. government makes a declaration like that or makes a, a conclusion like that, that means that any money that they have, whether it's a lot of money, a little bit of money, they're going to channel it to the priority areas that are described in that particular initiative. So once they made that commitment to feed the future, then whether they got the three and a half billion dollars or they didn't, they were going to um, focus on feed the future as, as their vehicle for, for funding their uh, global hunger issues. In January of uh, this year, there was a conference at Purdue University that uh, Julie Borlaug and I attended. Uh, she, on behalf of um, the Borlaug Institute, myself on behalf of BIFAD, and at that uh, conference, which was hosted by APLU. Um, it was the beginning of uh, dialogue with the land-grant university community as to what should we recommend to USAID sh as the priorities for research and activities um, to address global hunger through Feed the Future. And so um, a white paper was issued, and uh, in June of, of this year, there was a second conference or part two of this effort in which um, it was opened up then to all who wanted to come from land-grant universities to finalize some of these concepts as to what should be the recommendations, specific recommendations to give to USAID as to where should be their priorities for projects. And um, Mr. Butler is going to go over some of these, you know, we don't have time to, to do it in great detail, but he's going to give us a flavor for, for what they're looking for. Okay. Budget cuts to key agencies. We know that is going on, uh, very much so. Um, and so how is USAID dealing with that and yet trying to advance Feed the Future as their main initiative for addressing global hunger? So one of the things that USAID is doing is, well, um, whatever leftover funds that they had for this last fiscal year, uh, they're reprogramming them uh, for Feed the Future activities, and they're actually doing 
some um, subcontracting, if you will, or contracting to APLU to manage uh, the dispensation of those funds, and, and maybe Malcolm will talk to us a little bit about that. Uh, but the most important thing is reprogramming of their current funds. Um, and what they're doing is mostly the funding that uh, USAID gets, a lot of it gets distributed right away to the missions in the various countries, the USAID missions. And so those missions are fairly independent. They, they make decisions as to what projects to fund and so forth. Um, and so it's very important to know that um, having a good relationship and being, um, having good contacts in those missions is what's going to, to help us figure out uh, where the funding is going to go. Thirdly, um, USAID's strategy is to leverage funds by partnering with other donors. Um, they're making a point to, to tell um, folks that if you, if you have um, a partnership with either private industry or foundation or what have you, uh, you, can, you can have in-kind contributions. Whatever stretches those dollars as much as possible is, is the kinds of projects that, that they are wanting to, to fund. Another strategy of USAID in, in these austere economic times is to say, well, okay, we're probably not going to get any new money. In fact, we're not going to get any new money. We're going to get our budget cut. So we're going to have to narrow those 20 focus countries to a lot fewer so that we can um, affect a significant improvement in, in those countries and be able to show progress uh, as quickly as possible. And so they have narrowed down uh, the focus countries. Um, on the top left, you see the Ethiopia highlands in, in Africa as a, as a focus area. Uh, maize and maize systems in East Africa, such as in Zambia, Tanzania, Kenya, Malawi, Uganda, etc. cetera. Um, the Sudan, or South Sudan, frankly, and to the west, that whole strip uh, of blue uh, that you see there to Ghana, Liberia, Mali, etc. The rice and wheat systems of the Ganges Plains, Bangladesh and Nepal, and then in Latin America, uh, there's there's four focus countries, but they've narrowed them down. Really, they think it's going to be Haiti and Honduras that they're going to focus on. Uh, why Haiti? Because frankly, um, you know, with the devastating earthquake they had uh, in 2010, and with so so little progress having been made, the the government needs and feels the pressure to get something done in that country. So what should we do to get ready? You know, when we saw all of this happening before us, we said, well, we got to get ourselves ready. We can't just then sit back and just wait for RFAs to come out and try to respond. We've got to be uh, ready and have put on our thinking caps long before those RFAs come out. Um, and so as, as Dr. Sams mentioned, um, Dr. Hussey established this Feed the Future Steering Committee in the spring of, of this year, um, asked me to, to head it up, but it's a, feed, it's, a, it's a steering committee that is made up of uh, a lot of unit heads and, and folks that are at a, at a certain level where they can contribute uh, tremendously to, to um, developing a strategy on how we should proceed, and in fact, we developed such a strategy, uh, which, as, as he said, we call it the Borlaug 2.0 initiative. Okay, So Borlaug 2.0 is basically our internal strategy on how to get ourselves uh, positioned well. And we presented that to Dr. Hussey. He approved it. And basically, the Borlaug 2.0 initiative um, consists of three strategic areas. The first one is internal readiness, getting our act together. And we all agreed that to get our act together internally, to establish teams of researchers, extension folks, education people, um, we needed to get ourselves uh, marshaled. And today, this summit, that's what this is about. The faculty summit on international agriculture uh, was uh, developed as part of this internal readiness strategy. You know, we needed to get us together to start talking, and that's what we're here to do today. The second strategy or strategic area is networking. We've got to be able to uh, maximize our positioning and our partnerships 
with um, whether it's emission areas in specific countries, um, other partnerships that we need to cultivate, that, to strengthen, to establish. We've got to figure out who should be those people, those entities, and let's go after them and let's, let's partner with them as best as we possibly can. And the Borlaug Institute, of course, is tremendously helpful in this arena since they have some relationships already in lots of different countries and with lots of different people. And then the last um, strategic area would be funding and policy. Uh, using our government relations office to establish a presence in Washington, D.C., keep our, our finger on the pulse of what's going on there in terms of funding, opportunities, et cetera, and perhaps uh, make an influence on, on them in terms of the policies that they develop and, and where they decide their, their um, uh, focus areas to be, okay? How are we doing for time? Doing good. Okay. So the summit today and tomorrow, but certainly today, is to raise awareness among all of you about this effort. We want to begin the process of identifying people who have the interest, the expertise, the experience, the contacts to work on global hunger. And to hopefully, at the end of the day, we'll have some beginnings of ideas um, on projects that we can we can put together teams on a systems-based approach and with the right partners so that we can be successful at applying for some of these funding opportunities. That's really the, the bottom line here. And uh, we have some wonderful people who are going to be facilitating these discussions at, in the breakout sessions this afternoon, uh, who are going to, to tell you what are some of the priority areas in those particular geographic countries uh, that, that you're going to be focused on, depending on which uh, group you're going to be attending and uh, be able to then start to really put together you know some good thoughts good ideas so that when we leave this summit it's not like we all say well wasn't that a nice experience that was a nice lunch that they served and you know McGovern was a fascinating speaker all of those things are great but what we want is for at the end of the day um, get you guys together into some teams and then follow up with some some support for those teams to move forward, okay? And that's, that's what we're going to, to, to try to do, is support the formation of those teams and then support the continuation uh, of what those teams might do uh, in terms of writing proposals and so forth, okay? All right. But then tomorrow, uh, one of the things that Dr. Hussey wanted us to do is, he said, if you're gonna take the trouble of getting all these faculty together, um, and staff and so forth who are interested in international work. Um, let's do also some brainstorming as to how to make our programs better, okay? Um, I forget who it was who said that if you, you know, if you think that you've arrived, you know, you've got everything done just like you think it should be, you're gonna soon find yourself uh, looking at other people overtaking you. You can never rest in your laurels. In fact, uh, you, you all heard in the news that Steve Jobs passed away yesterday, and one of the stories I was reading in the paper, it talked about how he, there used to be at Apple uh, company, you know, there was a period of time when he wasn't the CEO anymore, he had been fired actually, and um, they kept in their uh, cafeteria um, a model or a, I guess a, a, a of an old Apple oh, Apple One computer. Okay. Well, when he came back in the 90s as the new CEO, and of course revolutionized Apple and took it to tremendous heights, as we all know, with the um, iPod and and iPhone and iPad and all these things. Um, you know, one of the first things he did is, is he took that thing out of there. He took that Apple One computer out of that room because he didn't want people to say, "Oh, look, aren't we great? We created that Apple One computer and and just." be thinking how great they are. No, it's innovation that requires you not to rest on your laurels, but continually look forward. What is the next thing I need to be doing? And just continually move forward. So that's very important uh, for us to be doing. So anyway, uh, so tomorrow what we're going to do is listen to a few presentations, especially we're going to have a nice round table discussion uh, from our colleagues from other language universities. I'm so pleased that we're going to have that discussion because we can learn so much from them. Obviously, they can learn some from us as well. Uh, I know we have Dr. Dadara here this morning. Dr. Dadara, where are you? 
There you are from Virginia Tech, my old alma mater. So welcome, sir. Great to have you here. Um, I'm not sure if we have any of the other folks yet. Uh, he was so eager to come that, that he came a, a little bit early, and we're pleased to have you, sir, and look forward to, to your insights. Um, he's led the international ag programs at Virginia Tech for many years, so I think we're going to learn a lot from Dr. Dadara tomorrow. Um, but then in the afternoon, we're going to engage in a SWOT analysis and then develop some recommendations to Dr. Hussey on how to enhance our international ag programs uh, from soup to nuts, all the way from research, extension, um, the academic side of things, um, everything, so that we can, we can keep at the top of the curve 